Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guy, the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week, we're talking about season four, episode three, titled Death and the Lady. Questionable name. I don't like that they named that the movie in this episode, Death and the Lady, and the name of the episode is that. <laughs> I enjoy the punny <laughs> titles oh, that Vice okay. comes up with. I don't know. I was just saying. It originally premiered on October 16th, 1987. It is written by David Black. He's got two episodes, one more coming. He was a story editor for season four. So we're probably, you know, he's involved with essentially every story in this season. So get used to David Black. And then there's this episode. So just warning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is directed by Colin Buxy. And he's got three or more episodes coming to all of them in season four, I believe. So again, this episode is kind of indicative of what we can expect more of in season four because these people are going to work a bunch on a bunch of episodes this season. So that's the thing. Yep. <laughs> Before we get started, I can check in and see what's going on in each other's lives. Guys, today was the Super Bowl. I know. I know we, are, we record this many days in advance before it comes out. <laughs> but today was the Super Bowl. And of course, the ads are in the Super Bowl. And there was a big movie trailer from someone who I'm constantly surprised keeps getting work. Hey, don't say bad things about him. <laughs> <laughs> Dwayne Johnson's new movie called Skyscraper. Skyscraper, in which he has to save his wife who's being held by terrorists from a large building under construction. Now, that that description sounds so familiar. If only there was another movie that had already done that. Yeah, maybe the greatest action movie that's ever been made. With Buck Buck. <laughs> already did the story. That Better, was. I'm sure. <laughs> just go. I'm just going on a well, land. You here. see, his even included terrorists and all that fun stuff. This one just looks like it's like I don't know. They get stuck in a building where there's like a fire, and so he's like <laughs> climax. Oh, no. Spoiler alert: He's got to jump from one building to another. <laughs> it's clearly terrorists. He's got like unless he's shooting the fire with heavy <laughs> artillery. <laughs> With you never gun. know. Did you watch? Did you watch San Andreas? You yeah, never oh, yes. know. I did, unfortunately. <laughs> he might just be shooting at an earthquake. I do love. <laughs> I do love Dwayne Johnson as a wrestler. <laughs> just it is. <laughs> I have to quantify that <laughs> as a wrestler. <laughs> it is an amazing turn of events with that. I was floored to find out that Jumanji is on its way to being a billion-dollar movie. Uh, yes. Number one box office wow. again this weekend, eight weeks in a row. Of course, we all know the Black Panther's going to overtake that, but hey, <laughs> it's okay. He held it for a while. Black <laughs> Panther's going to come out and I, rain over everything. I don't care about any of this. There's a Cloverfield movie on Netflix right now that I should be watching. <laughs> Speaking of remakes, this episode of Vice is clearly the precursor to that movie Eight Millimeter with Nicolas Cage. And you know, this is like a mid middle of the road episode for me as Miami Vice, but it's still better than that movie Eight Millimeter. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Nicolas Cage. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go break down this episode first, because it's you know it's got a really interesting twist and kind of told in a boring way. So let's go talk <laughs> about this episode. All right, so when we open up, we're at the Erotic Film Festival, which makes it feel like it's going to be much more exciting than what it is. And we do get some sexy time on a big screen. That was pretty nice. Yeah, I was it, trying to figure out how they could do that logistically. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Just saying, like, what if everyone doesn't want to see the nudie scenes, but you got it on this giant screen outside uh, this, like, hotel or something? <laughs> it, it was a nice, steamy open, and then it was ruined by this goofy-looking guy that comes out on stage, like, right in the good part. <laughs> i was really thrown off because it was like okay are they starting off like in one of those porno theaters that were a thing in the 70s and the 80s but this is it's an erotic film festival surprisingly the people in the crowd well, it's almost 100 percent women too it, it feels almost like an award show like it's the woodies except <laughs> they can't obviously use that name so it, it's whatever name they gave it with the high heel the announcer does give me the death race 2000 vibe <laughs> as the announcer yeah <laughs> and it is an award show they're giving an award to a man named glance who's going to be our main villain throughout this entire episode he's like the greatest thing that's ever existed in film and art and everything and people just worship the ground he walks on including when he makes a snuff porno yeah questionable well, <laughs> his defense in his defense snuffs snuff porn is in this year <laughs> 
The ladies are there, and so is the vice team, and I still don't know why they're there. They were there for security. It said it in the description. They were there just to be security in the, in the crowd. Mm, that's an they, interesting They kind of freelance. They don't get paid enough for Miami Dade. <laughs> That's just an interesting role for Vice, that they would be security. <laughs> I mean, uh, hookers and drugs. <laughs> Where else is it going to be? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. As Glance is accepting his award, a man comes running down. He's just screaming, you killed her, Glance. You killed her. You're going to pay. The ladies take him into handcuffs, and then we go to the opening credits. Now, I didn't point out, though, that in the movie that they're playing from Glance, Death and the Lady, like the man has a knife and we said it's a snuff film. Like he clearly stabs the actress in it. And I guess we're just, you know, everyone's just assuming that it's just art. He's wearing a like a wolf mask too. Glance, the man that's playing Glance is our first guest star in this episode. Yeah, so our first guest star is Paul Guilfoyle. He also plays John Baker in the upcoming episode, Victims of Circumstance. Mm. So he will return. As someone um, different? Yes, as someone different. Not Weird. like his character in this episode didn't, you know, make you feel like he might be a reoccurring <laughs> character eventually. Um, but that's here nor there. Uh, he's actually been in a ton of movies and, t- uh, and TV stuff. Movies, he was in Howard the Duck, probably his best movie. <laughs> well, obviously, yes. Um, <laughs> he was in Beverly Hills Cop 2, Three Men and a Baby, Wall Street, Cadillac Man, Alpha, Miss Doubtfire, Ransom, Amistad, because that goes with all those others. <laughs> you know, and then when you like on the TV side of it, he's most known for being Captain Jim Brass in the C- in the show CSI, which he played on from 2000 to 2014. Wow, um, he's so, actually yeah. in a quite a selection of movies. Like that was He's actually in a bunch of really good movies. Yeah, he's in a bunch of, and I'm and now I'm like, who was he in all these movies? Like, yeah. who was he in Howard the Duck? Uh-huh. Who was he in all these other things? <laughs> yeah, and I actually left a bunch out. I could have included L.A. Confidential or The Negotiator. There were just so many movies to choose from. When we come back from the opening credits, we're at the precinct, and the duo are talking to that man that came running down the stairs and screaming about how Glance had killed her. His name is Tulane. <laughs> yeah. He's just, not, just, just, just His, name his is name's Tulane. Tulane. <laughs> <laughs> he's also a porn star. He's a porn star and also does a bunch of odd jobs. So you can probably get him to fix your bathroom. And you and go, also, fix your bathroom. And also some nude modeling while he's there. <laughs> right over the toilet. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, yeah. He's a professional at laying pipe. <laughs> yep. <laughs> he's telling them the woman is dead, that the woman that you see stabbed in the movie, she's really dead. And Sonny just doesn't want to hear it at all. I, I like how they don't take it serious at all. Right away, they're like, this is stupid. You know it's just a movie, right? Well, I, like, I, I like how his justification for the fact that he knows she's dead because the director made them do it over and over and over. <laughs> just stabbing her over and over again. Yeah. <laughs> Tulane insists that what happened was that Glance had an actress that was in there that they were shooting all day. And then at the very end, they brought in someone different and a different man in a wolf mask that then really kills her in that scene. Yes. And he lets everyone go home and just uses one cameraman. And then apparently Tulane, which I don't know why, but (laughs) he's not the cameraman. I don't know. (laughs) But Sonny is not hearing. He's like, basically, you were in jail before and there's no evidence in the and then you reported this when you got out of jail, too. They went and investigated. There was no blood. Like, why are you wasting my time? Get the hell out of here. This also seems like it would be an obvious thing is find the actress. Like, why don't you just act the, ask the actress first? Like, <laughs> are you yeah. alive? Yes, I am. Okay. <laughs> can, can I ask you about this next scene? What's with the cat in the box? <laughs> Apparently, at some point in time, we were to know that Gina had a cat and that also Gina lost her cat. Well, she, they say it in this episode. They say, that we're so sad you lost your cat. And so and they give it to her. And Sunny so, does it in the most so condescending did, did, way, too. Yeah, I know. Did, did someone mail her a new cat? Is that what's no, happening they went, here? No, they went out and got <laughs> the cat. Is, is the cat both alive and dead in the box? No. Well, it's clearly alive because they pull it out. But yeah, they pretend it's ev- it's an evidence box. And they go like, oh, we got some evidence for you. And they all wait around for her to open it. And then when she gets scared, because she's like, what the hell is in this box? It's moving. They're like, go ahead, open it. And it's a kitty. There's two things that I learned about Gina in this scene. One, that's that she lost her cat. And Sonny's so nice that he got her another one. Yep. Even though he like rolls his eyes. And it's like, now we shut up about your missing cat. But Did- two... 
Gina yeah. also says, she's like, hey, Glance makes this erotic performance art and it's kind of hot. She says she likes it. She's like, some of it's pretty good. You can get into it. <laughs> Everyone's like, hmm. <laughs> Sunny wants to give up on the Glance case. He doesn't want to talk to Knox anymore, but Tubbs. See, the real cop has that oh, intuition. Please. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's about porn, okay? That's what he wants to investigate. <laughs> Look at him. He's wearing a vest, too. He looks so he looks so handsome today. Tubbs wearing his vest. Tubbs like, no way. We're going to keep investigating. Tubbs thinks that Knox or Tulane took a big risk coming to talk to him and continuing to talk to him, breaking his parole by showing up or his probation. By showing up at Glance's party. At the, this is really interesting. We should check more into this. And then dad comes out. And he's like, yeah, sonny, shut the hell up. Yeah, you are. And <laughs> and then in the most Castillo way ever, he goes, get that cat out of here. He goes, what is that? <laughs> the, kitten, the kitten will get it out of here. And, and all grumpy. And that's when I was like, Castillo, you jerk. You don't like cats. <laughs> Clearly, Sonny doesn't either, based on how he holds this cat throughout the episode. <laughs> it's clear, it, what I think it is clear is that Don Johnson's never had a cat. Okay, <laughs> he like holds it like it's a rag doll the entire episode. It was really bugging me. It's like, why are you holding that kitten like that? Hold it like a baby. It's a kitten. He, he's also. It should be obvious. I mean, he bought a cat and put it in a box. Yeah, exactly. To transport it. <laughs> Poor kitty. He's been walking around all day with a cat in the box. <laughs> <laughs> After dad says that they need to keep looking into this case, we head over to Glance's art house. And Glance and is making some interesting art here. I don't call that art. Glance is doing just normal guy stuff. Just normal <laughs> things people do when they hang out. Like <laughs> saran wrapping down one-eyed homeless guys and then painting them. Well, first you have to find the one-eyed homeless Eye guy stuff. to do it to. <laughs> I'd be really concerned if I was one-eyed Willie. Because Glance <laughs> also burns his paintings after he's done with them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sunny, it's just Sonny that's there at his studio. And so Sonny's talking to him about, hey, so we are investigating this. Tulane's talking about it. Well, so what happened on this set? And Glance says, we didn't credit her in the movie because it was just some chick. Like, ouch. Yeah, I know. Well, she did act mm -hmm. in it. How come he didn't give her credit? He says they got her from the peep shows, which is mm -hmm. the minor leagues. So, <laughs> and I mean, come on, man. You got to start somewhere. <laughs> they called her Blondie. That's what he said. He goes, they call her Blondie. And so when Sonny asks, so where is she? He's like, I don't know. She's probably working the crowd. You know, she's from the peep show. Like, <laughs> she's stand to work a lot of money here. <laughs> the conversation ends kind of strangely because he lights the painting on fire and then there's like this awkward silence between the two like, like i think he's trying to intimidate sunny but really he's just lighting something on fire and there's just <laughs> this like strange silence and sunny's very confused like i don't see any horses or lakes or <laughs> this, this isn't a bob ross <laughs> 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 he's not able to get any information out of glance glance says i don't know who she is we hired her just for this one movie best of luck to you meanwhile at the same time tubbs is out talking to people that work on the film so at first he talks to the lighting person and says it's a normal shoot went for drinks after even the actress was there there was no problems he also talks to the we were all drunk i swear <laughs> he also talks to the cameraman who says no one died but I also didn't shoot one scene. The knife scene, I didn't shoot. Glance shot that on his own. And tried to sneak it in there and not tell me. And then when I saw it, I was like, that's not my work. And I asked him, he's like, haha, you caught me. <laughs> Sorry. He does say he he didn't do the, sh do the knife shoot because that's not his type of filming. See, he's not very good at taking pictures of knives and people stabbing. <laughs> it always comes out blurry. <laughs> Never good at th taking those pictures. So. <laughs> so they've gotten nowhere. Tubbs and Crockett both go talk to basically everyone involved except for the actress. Because they haven't found her yet. Sonny knows where to go when he hears Peep Show. You funny, Tubbs didn't go there, though. Just, no. just Sonny. They didn't go just, together. <laughs> just Sonny knows. He knows this has got to be my spot <laughs> at Wankers Away. <laughs> <laughs> he does have a boat. Wankers Away. <laughs> He does have a boat, so, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. And within within seconds of walking in, someone asks him if he's down the party. And it's like, this is Sonny Crockett. Of course he's down the party. <laughs> you mean Sonny Burnett down the party. Crockett's not. Okay. Sonny Burnett. 
<laughs> Sorry. Uh, so, so this is I love this scene because they get him in the booth, and first he puts in two dollars, and that gets him like thirty seconds. <laughs> and so then he continues the conversation at fifty cent increments. <laughs> All I could think was she until, was making nothing. I'm like, that's nothing. You until 50 spending, a, <laughs> yeah, until spending a whopping. Three dollars. So, um, <laughs> and, and for three dollars, all we learn is that she's alive, or at least we <laughs> she think she's is alive. In fact, alive. <laughs> yeah, to give him the old switcheroo in the peep show booth goes from one woman who he's trying to get information out of into Lori, the actress that they're looking for. So she's fine. Everything's fine. They also milked him uh, for a couple bucks. <laughs> Unfortunately, Barnett ran out of quarters, so we couldn't <laughs> confirm that it was the same actress. <laughs> He's like, yeah, good enough. <laughs> <laughs> then he waved off the camera. It's like, okay, this is sunny time. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, and while we're having sunny time, this is where we first meet Lori Swan, played by Kelly Lynch. Kelly Lynch, a model turned actress. Um, she's actually done quite a few big name movies herself. Some of her early work includes Roadhouse and Drugstore Cowboy. She was in Mr. Magoo, which I mentioned because another uh, guest star was also in that movie. She was in Charlie's Angels, and she is said to have turned down the role of Catherine Trammell in Basic Instinct that eventually went to Sharon Stone. Oh. But I have seen... Sharon Stone's audition tape for that role. <laughs> and I can tell you there was no way anyone was picking anyone but Sharon Stone for that part. <laughs> Sorry, Kelly. <laughs> as far as TV goes, Kelly Lynch has been in 26 episodes of Fatherhood. She was in 15 episodes of the reboot 90210, the 2010 2010 to 11. Uh, she was also in 13 episodes of the TV show Magic City and 10 episodes of Mr. Mercedes. Well, now we're going to see the bleeding heart of Sonny Crockett. They go back over to Tulane's and they tell him, look, we found the actress. We talked to everyone. Everything's fine. We we found her. Every, she's fine. You need to stop bugging us. Like we're we're gonna start start hanging up on your phone calls. Please don't contact us anymore. <laughs> but Tulane is just beside himself, wailing about how they killed her, and I can't sleep at night. And you get this long pause on Sunny as they leave. Like it's weighing on him as though this man can't be lying. Well, it doesn't make any sense. Why would he lie? I can't figure that out through the whole thing. When they when they aren't sure that he's telling the truth. Why would he make it up though? What would be the point of making it up? That Tubbs is right. He, all he has is stuff to lose by making it up. He's gonna he's not gonna be able to work anymore. No one's gonna work with him if he's lying. He's he's got a criminal, he's gonna go to jail because he broke his probation. Why would he lie? It doesn't make any sense. And of course, that means that Sonny is now paying attention. Yeah, before, <laughs> before I wasn't, okay? I was like, I had a kitten in a box to worry about. I've got to make sure it's alive. <laughs> so back at the precinct, when they're so now watching... now he's got an excuse to watch porn over and over and over again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> at the precinct, when they're re-watching the film for the 18th time, he finally notices that the actress in the stabbing scene, that she, her eyes are dead. Which I don't know what that means. So I couldn't figure it out every time I watched it. I'm like, it looks pretty normal to me. <laughs> because the actress who's really playing, who's Kelly Lynch, she's not dead. So <laughs> That bothered me a little bit too. Like, this is the turning point. What convinces him is her eyes are dead. Like, like how is that? I guess if you're studying, you've seen I, I that know. many dead bodies. Well, it's either that or the lady that he's dated are like, they're not dead. They're just done. No, just <laughs> that, that, that last prostitute he got, he accidentally choked her a little too far. And she had that same look in her eye. <laughs> we do have another guest star that makes a brief appearance in this precinct scene, too. Yeah, this is where we get our unnamed DA because, uh, you know, why, why bother giving him a name? <laughs> um, uh, Miguel Ferrer. Miguel Ferrer has been in a, a few cop shows and movies. He's also the cousin of George Clooney. <laughs> say what? <laughs> okay, I'm not going to say anything. Throwing Clooney, that out there. Clooney just soaked up all the looks and charm in that say, entire family. I was going to say, He's like, all just ouch. concentrated into one person. <laughs> ouch. Ouch. To I, the I, I, per, Clooney. I love Miguel because he was on six seasons of Crossing Jordan. He's no George. Come on he, now. He, 
<laughs> he was also from 2012 till 2017. Uh, the uh, played the assistant director Owen Granger on NCIS LA. He's most known for being the OCP vice president Bob Morton in RoboCop. I'd buy that for a dollar. He was also in Hot Shots Part Two. Well, there's that. Yes. <laughs> he was also in Mr. Magoo with Kelly Lynch. He was in Traffic, Iron Man 3. Unfortunately, passed away last year in January from throat cancer. Hmm. Yeah, that I didn't know. I didn't know because I saw him in the memoriam thing, or like at the end of unre- uh, like a reward show or thing. Well, of course, Sonny happens to know the greatest porn archivist in the history of man. Which is who he goes to see next, who immediately recognizes Lori. And like, oh yeah, she was in this movie and in that movie. I haven't left this little basement in nine years either. Yeah, I have it all right. <laughs> yeah, Pictures yeah. still, everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, wait, I know what movie you're talking about. I was jerking off to that the other day. Here, <laughs> here are the stills to that one. <laughs> and they find out that she's got not a twin, but someone just looks a lot like her. It's They're not actually... Like they're not biological them. twins. They just like uh, they're very much they look alike. Exactly. So now Sonny's really worked up. He knows that she's dead and that there's a twin. So that, that means that there may be two girls in that movie. Although Laura might be alive, Blaze, who's the other lady, may be dead. So he goes back over to Wankers. I mean, it's his normal Wednesday stop anyway. <laughs> so <laughs> and he goes and beats up a hooker until he finds out <laughs> who who Blaze is. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he's a little irritable in this episode. He he beats up quite a few people. <laughs> the hooker at Wanker says that she also blazed does work at an art school. So the ladies head over to the art school to go ask around if anyone's seen her. And they talk to the teacher who immediately recognizes Blaze and says that she's not a real artist. She doesn't do that good of work. But yeah, I guess she a bad does thing. come around here. <laughs> yeah, that's a bad thing to say about her. <laughs> what bugs me is that they make a point to show you these weird drawings that she does in this drawing book, but the book has the drawings end up having no, no impact on the rest of the episode. Like, yeah, I know. I don't know why they did list. that either. We do find out that her name is Amy Ryder. And so now, for some reason, the ladies don't go see Amy Ryder. Sunny then goes up to the Ryder apartment to go talk to her. So I don't know why the teams are split like this. Because they don't want the ladies to do anything serious. <laughs> they're, they're just taking turns working. That way, you know, they only have to do something every couple hours. <laughs> yeah. Sunny shows up at the Ryder apartment and pretends to be from the art school and says that he got amy's locker and wants to deliver her book back to her jill amy's supposed sister which is what jill says like oh she's not in she just stepped out but she'll be back in a few minutes jill now, by the way played by penelope ann miller who was actually married to will arnett for a year in the 90s miller began her career in a play called biloxi blues with matthew broderick that eventually became a 1988 movie that she would star in with broderick she would go from there to movies like adventures in babysitting big top peewee before she would start doing some pretty big movies like carlito's way on came a spider the artist awakenings kindergarten cop but vice was actually one of her very very first roles wow Everyone who's all the guest stars in this episode have <coughs> deep acting credits. Like they get involved with a lot of stuff later. <laughs> mm-hmm. So now the duo are off to go talk to Glance again. And they show up at his party. Uh, I don't know. He's the artist life, right? So he's just always either having parties or burning paintings. That's just what <laughs> yep. he does. <laughs> don't forget killing people. It's a mystery and <laughs> how he makes money. That's what you always live with, right? By the hey. way, we are officially halfway through this episode and we have absolutely no evidence that a crime has actually been committed. They have zero proof. Other than that Sunny saw someone's dead eyes. That's proof yes. enough, okay? <laughs> <laughs> the duo talk to Glance. Like, yeah, I know about Amy Ryder, but you know, I work with a lot of people. I don't. Nec- I don't. Re- I have to remember everyone I work with. You can't hold it to me. I'm not on trial here. <laughs> you gonna arrest me or what? <laughs> I also use this woman named Margot that was also in the movie too. She did the knife scene. Look, she's just fine. Look at her right here. She's standing here with me. <laughs> yes. And instantly, Rocket's staring at her and demands that. All, uh, demands all of Margot's work. We need copies of everything. <laughs> Her 
Her <laughs> eyes were also dead, though. He her noticed. eyes were dead. And Sonny also has a slight out-of-body experience when he sees Margo. <laughs> <laughs> Sonny's being really hard on Glance. He's, you know, like, you're dirty. I know you killed someone, but I just got to find a way to prove it. Essentially, that's what his whole MO is in this meeting. And Glance is having fun with it, including at the end when it's for his, I guess, the party's for his birthday. That he stares at Sunny and then stabs the knife down into the cake as if he's like stabbing a body. Because it's got a woman's body on it. <laughs> I mean, come on, that's a little weird. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Stop the show, though. Do you you can't cut a cake like that. I mean, what is he trying to? What is he want to watch the world burn? I mean, that's just insanity. <laughs> yeah, that was really annoying. It's like with those people that cut their pizza backwards. <laughs> yes, <laughs> monsters. Monster. How are you going to make that cake even now? <laughs> <laughs> From that point on the episode, I knew he was guilty. Yep. <laughs> Sociopath. <laughs> that night out of Sonny's boat, Sonny's looking through the stills and watching the movie again. He has pants on. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> just, also... just Sonny and Apollo Lube <laughs> going, <laughs> reviewing the evidence. <laughs> He's also watching Glance do an interview on local TV. And in the interview, Glance says people like violence. He's just a facilitator of it. Yeah, he's really annoying. <laughs> uh, you know, in, in this next scene, uh, he's like out on the boat, kind of like staring off into the distance. And I don't think we've seen Sonny this shake up over our case since the meat fondler episode. <laughs> like he's starting to lose it. <laughs> Interesting you mentioned that. I will come back to that. <laughs> <laughs> While he's doing his thinking time, Tubbs happens to stop by. And Sonny then tells this story. Sonny tells this story that people have heard a lot. And continually, we do end up doing nothing about it, which is the football team has a woman at a party uh, in high school. And then she gets a little too drunk and then they have fun with her and take pictures of her and then share pictures of her. And he has this guilt, not for not stopping it from happening, but from not taking but down the picture. Because he still had pictures. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, and also not telling her, like he could have told her, like, hey, did you know they have pictures of you and they're putting them in the, but he didn't take them down and he didn't tell her. So, yeah, yeah you're a shithead. No, I'm <laughs> yeah, pretty you're much. Pretty you know, and, and the way he starts off, I was expecting him to be a, uh, to to admit to Tubbs that he had murdered someone. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, I thought the story when I first watched the episode, I thought the story was going to go. And then, like, I told her and then, you know, whatever. And it was bad because I told her. Then I mean, because it could be bad to know, too. But no, it was that mm -hmm. he was a coward and he didn't do anything. <laughs> yes. And, I've, and I'm pretty sure he still has the pictures. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I get the feeling like it is in Evan where he's trying to explain how Evan was gay and he never stood up for him. Yeah, well, um, he was at fault in that one. <laughs> 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 he was. <laughs> but this is also the thing that we're now talking about 31 years later as still being a massive problem. So, you know, yes. if we were willing to do something about it earlier. Yeah, no, they made my yes. advice episodes we about still it, but they were not. About, <laughs> yes, we were still talking about Don Johnson being a coward 30 years later. <laughs> <laughs> and then Sonny, who now has his master's degree in film, shows Tubbs how the sequence of the shots are out. Like the frames. I still don't understand that. I still didn't get what he was talking like about. Every scene, every frame yes. in the filming is numbered, but the number is sequence is out of order for when the stabbing happened. No, no. What he's saying is they should be way out of order because it was shot way because he shot other scenes like whether he did other the, the cameraman said he did other stuff by himself, location stuff and stuff like that. But they're too, they're really close together. That's then he's lying about that. Also, also they're they're clearly different people, and one of them looks. But let's continue explaining the Illuminati. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> so he thinks something up. He asks Tubbs, like, "Hey, if I think something's up, you think something's up, and Castillo does. We all can't be wrong, can we?" Question. Mark, bigger question mark. Only we had that thing, you know, that thing. <laughs> Tubbs just has this look on his face like, I told you, I told you days ago <laughs> that there was something <laughs> suspicious about this case. <laughs> so Sonny races back off to go to the writer apartment, bangs on the door. Jill opens the door again. The dad's in the back. They clearly live very poorly. She finally admits that she knew that her sister was leaving to make that movie. 
but that her dad had disowned her because of the types of work that she did. Um, what are you talking about? She doesn't have a sister. Yeah, first she <laughs> first he said the dad said she they didn't have a sister. It was she was an only child. Mm-hmm. Then they finally get out and of I her. That believes yes, the dad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then they finally get out of her that yes, he had a sister and and she doesn't talk about her because the dad gets so upset because she wouldn't did and she knew the last time she saw her she was going off to go work on a film for glance. Yeah. And then there's a quick stop at the morgue where Tubbs is talking to someone saying, "Hey, get me the information on the five blonde women who have recently been stabbed that are in the morgue, you know, where they might have started." Yeah, exactly. Too. And no surprise, the guy that works at the morgue is super yes. creepy. <laughs> when I first saw him, I thought, like, why are they talking to another porn geek? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> He's a different kind of porn geek. <laughs> so now the duo are going to gang up on Jill, and they finally get the information that they want. Jill breaks down with the dad there. This is brutal. That is brutal that they made him watch. The- that was uh, really bad. They made him watch the video. Like, why do you make him watch a video of his daughter doing porn and then being murdered in it? Like, you have no heart. Yeah. I know. And he's dying, he's, too. And yeah. then Jill lets out that Amy was doing that, agreed to do that because she was dying. She was really sick and she was dying. Only a few weeks left to live. So she took the money and let Glance kill her for the movie so that she could pay for her dad's treatments. She had thoracic cancer and the dad's sick. So, but they, but why, did they, why couldn't they do that without the dad in the room? Why'd they make him watch it? Exactly. Like, they just tortured yeah. this poor man who didn't know any of this stuff was happening. He would be better off living in yeah. that his daughter got murdered and not that she willingly got murdered. To or that she did poor. his treatment. <laughs> and it's at this point in the episode that you might as well cue the Law & Order music. We arrest them, and then the DA shows up, and you can almost feel like Vice wanted to go into the courtroom with this. Exactly, because at the precinct, when they're explaining to Castillo what happened and how everything went down, the DA's like, you don't have enough evidence, enough information for me to be able to make a case. Like, what are you talking about? So we have like this, her confessing <laughs> the money, um, the cameraman saying oh, the sequence of photos. <laughs> he didn't buy the sequence either, though. <laughs> Well, my favorite part is uh, is he throws out there, I'm 60% with you, but that's not going to hold up in court. <laughs> Thanks for the percentage. <laughs> Although he was right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> At the courthouse the next day, the DA is still really upset. He doesn't have enough for a case or walking out after talking to the judge. And he's saying that no one saw the murder and that it's not and that Tulane's not believable. He's just some crackhead. <laughs> well, I mean, unfortunately, that is the truth. Like, he's a porn star crackhead. Who's going to believe him? <laughs> so, then, obviously, perfect time to gloat um, <laughs> if, if you're Milton. He comes over and it's like, hey, look, I'm really popular. I do really good art and everyone loves me and you got nothing on me. So, see you later. Because <laughs> earlier in the episode, they talked about how he had done, he was commissioned by the mayor to do some art in his house. So, the mayor has some porn <laughs> going on. Just, that, just, you know, the uh, mayor of Miami uh, likes snuff porn. Just, <laughs> just so you know, in the, at this time. He, he even starts doing that kind of hypothetical, like, well, if I did kill her, I would have done this. My favorite part about this this part of this scene is that Castillo is behind <laughs> Crockett. He's like, ouch, man. Ouch. Yeah, I know. He's like like I'm trying to look, yeah, like trying to look. <laughs> yeah, he's like embarrassed for him. Like, I'm sorry, detective. Keep doing your job, though. But that was bad. You got owned. It, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> it was he got owned so much that he spent the next six hours driving around with a def- <laughs> it, uh, it, in his Ferrari with the defeated Crockett montage. <laughs> and a different hairstyle. Which, <laughs> yes, in which I'm almost certain they got the wrong song for it. Like they should have just started out with like these broken wings. <laughs> <laughs> well, John, you mentioned earlier that this episode had this meat fondler vibe to it because Sonny's taking it so personal, just has this crazy hunch. That driving scene where he's got a totally different haircut, which is clearly filmed at <laughs> some other time, is leftover footage. From the Meat Fondler episode. So there you go. Oh, okay. <laughs> they don't have time to let Don Johnson drive around, okay? Just use some old scene, even though he's got short hair. <laughs> so now we're going to go to the last scene of the episode. Sonny, after driving around for seven days, finally <laughs> decides to go yes. pay Glance one last visit. He comes into the studio. It's late at night. Glance Just comes breaking walking. and entering is not illegal if you're a cop. <laughs> 
<laughs> Glance saunters down the stairs. Sunny's standing in front of a picture. It's a blowing up picture of the quote unquote dead eyes. So Glance again gloating over Vice that he's going to get away with this. But Sonny's going to get his revenge. You know how? Sonny's going to slap the shit out of him. He'd slap the hell out <laughs> of him. Yes. yes. Sonny Barnett is going to smack the crap out of him for about a good minute and a half. So, which... Which really makes me wonder because the the episode kind of just ends after this, and it makes me wonder like, well, well, couldn't he get in trouble for this for breaking in and assaulting this guy? I, I guess we'll never find out. Also, he just leaves his car there. <laughs> that drug that was driving me crazy. He just walks away. His car's parked right there. Where are you going, Sonny? Get in your car yes. and drive away. <laughs> Don't leave your car behind. I was I was very happy though that I got a chance to see One Eyed Willie is okay. He yep. has been decellophaned um, and sitting aside and joining the 40. <laughs> and that's the end of this episode. It's just kind of peters out at the end. No pun intended. <laughs> and <laughs> the only benefit we get is seeing Sunny slap the hell out of somebody. Otherwise, like nothing happens. That's my favorite, Sonny, when he's unhinged. <laughs> smacking people around. <laughs> so let's go talk about this week's music. Because I'm going to save everything for my final thoughts. Because th- this episode is okay. There's just, it's missing some substance. So but I'll talk about that more in a little bit. Let's go talk about this mu- this week's music first, though. All right, John, we got quite a bit of music in this episode. Some people we've heard from before, some new people. What do you got for us this week? So, yeah, let's start with artists that we have already heard from. We have the songs Never Let Me Down Again and Pleasure, Little Treasure by Depeche Mode. Depeche Mode, you'll remember from our episode El Viejo. We've already talked about these guys. The band consists of Dave Gahan on vocals, Martin Gore on keyboards and guitar, Andrew Fletcher also on keyboards, uh, and Alan Wilder would join after Vincent Clark would leave after the first album on drums. Depeche Mode was incredibly successful in the late 80s, sold over 100 million records, and before already pretty much talked about their journey as a band so we'll talk a little bit about the band members themselves martin gore actually after vincent clark left the band after the first album marcus gore took over writing song duties and pretty much all of their big songs personal jesus they were all written by gore all you need to know about martin gore is that he's Pretty much lyrically, the uh, Depeche Mode. Dave Gohan was more of the musician. His actually his story is kind of interesting. He was born David Calcott in 1962, but his his dad left when he was six months old. His mom would remarry oil executive Jack Gahan. He would pass away when Dave was ten, and Dave would start acting out. He would. St- steal cars, joyride, get caught with graffiti, and actually got put in one of those, like, detention schools. Through the beginning of his adulthood, he would go through, like, 20 different jobs until finally settling down, doing uh, displays in store windows, would eventually be invited to join the band after performing David Bowie's Heroes at just a local nightclub. And then there is Andy Fletcher, who, in his own words, he said, Martin's the songwriter, Alan's the good musician, Dave's the vocalist, and I just bum around. <laughs> and pretty much. That's, that's an accurate pretty statement. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he kind of just hangs around and gets paid to be there. So that's just a little bit more about Depeche Mode. Let's talk about the other three songs we got. We have Vet for the Insane from Fields of Nephilim which is an English goth rock band formed in 1984. The band's name actually refers to uh, the biblical ra- a biblical race of giants, or angel and human hybrids. Lyrically, the band incorporates magical themes, including Cthulhu mythos, the Sumerian religion, chaos magic, and the works of Aleister Crowley a 19th century musician and novelist. (laughs) They kind of spun their image based off of old spaghetti western and often wore cowboy dusters with a weathered look, which they would actually literally use flour to weather their clothes for photo shoots and performances. Between 85 and 90, they would release three albums with some mediocre success in the UK, mostly on 
indie charts. In 91, the band would play their final gigs before frontman Carl McCoy would leave the band. The remaining members of the band would change their name to Rubicon and release two albums before disbanding in the mid-90s. McCoy, on the other hand, see, he would form a new group called Nephilim, N-E-F-I-L-I-M. <laughs> oh, I see what you did there. Ah. See what I did there? <laughs> PH became an F right there. So, But they would only release one album, the album Zune, which after years of held back from being released due to disagreements with the label, would finally re- be released in 96 and would be the only album that band would would release. 98 to 2002, the band would do a re- uh, some reunion shows. They would also put out new album, their first since breaking up. To this day, occasionally they do get back together, collaborate, do shows. I think they've released another album in the 2000s as well. But that leads us to The Story Never Ends by Naked Prey, who is a U.S. rock band from Tucson, Arizona, formed in 1982 by former Green on Red drummer Van Christian and Giant Sandworms member David Seeger. The band was credited with helping pioneer what was known as Desert Rock Sound. It was associated with a number of bands in, from the Tucson area in the ni- 80s and 90s. You which lie. I guess desert, you lie. I, I guess, <laughs> I guess <laughs> desert rock is like a country punk. Of course, Arizona would have some weird mixture of music that's only in Arizona because it's too stupid to weave its way into regular society. And I say that as an Arizona. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So but I will make you feel a little bit better, Tom. Naked Prey would release seven albums from 1984 to 1995. Very little commercial success, but would accrue a cult following in Europe like several other Tucson area bands from that era. (laughs) So somewhere in Europe, people really dug desert rock. I've heard from people who have traveled to Europe that people in Western, like Northwestern Europe, say Germany and, and and the Netherlands and stuff, that they're really fascinated with cowboys and the, the American Southwest, mm. like that that lifestyle. And so, okay, that kind of makes sense. They'd also be into mm. music that's supposedly from there. Whatever, they can have it. Yeah. <laughs> the band would break up in the mid-90s, but they reunite periodically to do a performance here and there, mostly in, in random parts of, of Europe, because uh, no one else. <laughs> and then that leads us to The Edge of Town by the band The Truth. And The Truth was a British rock band from 1982 to 1989. They did a new wave. They were formed by Dennis Greaves, who was formerly of the blues band Nine Below Zero, and Mick Lister in 1982. The band would go through numerous uh, lineup changes, but only Dennis and Mick would be continuous members throughout the band's time. Their debut album would be released in 1985, the album Playground. 87's Weapon of Love album would mark a stylistic change and would also see the most commercial success with the title track hitting number 7 on US rock charts and number 65 on Hot on the Hot 100 as well as several songs from the album being used on the 1987 sci-fi film The Hidden which apparently has some kind of cult following the band would disband after 1989's Jump would be released and then they would reform in 2012 for a few shows with the plan of more shows. Whether or not they ever did those shows, I have no idea. Pretty much that that's your music. I was actually um, really surprised at how diverse, even though the music all sounded very similar, very diverse backgrounds that the bands come from. You know, and I, I do, I will point out, Fields of Nephilim is considered somewhat influential. They're the ones who did, like, the magic dark metal songs. So they were actually kind of influential during their time, even though they weren't, commercially successful several bands have referenced them as being influence just i mean just based on the description of them and the sound of their music when when i heard it in the episode when i looked it up they were like the 80s version of imagine dragons i guess would be like the easiest way to describe it those are all words that i recognize 
<laughs> you know who Magic Dragon is. <laughs> I'm aware of those. Those are words that you can put together, and some people <laughs> might refer to them as a band. Uh, in my knowledge of Imagine Dragons, not in this house. But well, no one it... thinks of a band. <laughs> <laughs> well. Let's go give our final thoughts on this episode because I think we're happy to have seen and to have moved on from this episode. <laughs> Let's go break this one down for the last time. All right, John, how about you kick us off this week? What are your final thoughts on this episode? All right. So my final thoughts is it was a little boring. You know, I made that comment earlier that it, we were halfway through the episode and we still hadn't really proven anything had happened yet. Uh, it was a little bit slow going. And it really reminded me of an early episode of Law & Order, just minus all of the court scenes. We didn't have any of our normal real vice car chases. There weren't any shootouts. Nothing exploded. Instead, we got a solid story about snuff film, murder, mystery kind of thing. Especially as we got later into the episode, I really felt like the episode would have been better if they had those had court scenes in there, like a Law & Order episode. Like, that was almost... It almost felt like that's what was missing at the end of this episode. Melissa, what are your final thoughts on this episode? <laughs> uh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I also thought this episode, I've always thought this episode is very boring. Um, I think, I feel like this episode is in a way too overdramatic. I understand like the, uh, obviously the, the subject matter is very dramatic and it should have been more, I think it should have been more emotional and more dramatic, but it wasn't, it was like clumsy and I don't, I don't know. I didn't appreciate them trying to put in like funny things, you know, like throw, if John's right. Throwing the cat in there. That was a weird thing to put in there. Like why would you even put the cat in there? So I didn't like the episode. It's, it drags on. I feel, for me, it just drags on and you don't get any resolution out of it. I don't understand the end at all. Why even show him go and beat him up? Like nothing happens. Great. You smacked him around, but he still got away with murder. So that doesn't make you feel any better that he got any justice. There's no justice for her family. They're not going to, he's still going to be poor and the dad's still going to be sick. So yeah, I don't like this episode. It just, it was too long and drawn out for nothing to actually happen. So, this is what I'm saying. So just yeah. quick question. Does that mean that Son Sonny Crockett is now 0-4 versus bad guys? <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> I would say... You know, I don't have a lot to argue with, right, with with you guys on this episode. I didn't hate it. You know, I guess not hate is a strong word for what you guys are saying. Like, you guys didn't like it. I was like, okay, yeah. You know, it was a normal Vice episode. I was kind of disappointed that we started with nothing and then we ended with nothing. It was like this episode just didn't need to exist. I do appreciate, though, that this so far this season, they've tackled really odd topics on things that were happening in the 80s. So we have televangelism and now we have this snuff. And not saying this is this widespread problem in the 80s, but it was definitely like a culture thing where people were collectively nervous about as the porn industry grew and people were more brazen about porn in general and the evolution of women in the 80s and uh, more women empowerment. And so there was this nervousness in the 80s of what women were up to, I guess. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know how to properly explain it. Other than there was a lot of people that felt like that women were being given too much freedom. And so they were doing impro improper things. And with that, which is obviously all based on lies and stereotypes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but this episode is, eh, it's okay. I'm happy that, like I was saying, I'm glad that they tackled a hard topic, but they didn't actually tackle it. They kind of just, we kind of waited through it. We're tangentially aware of it now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> they grazed it. <laughs> That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Go With The Heat. We would love to hear from you. Email us, go with the heat at gmail.com. Get us on Twitter, twitter.com slash go with the heat. Facebook.com slash go with the heat. Be sure to check out that website, go with the heat.com. You can find all the ways to contact us, including the ones I just said, plus more. You can find all the ways to subscribe, including YouTube, TuneIn, iTunes, Google Play. I mean, you name it, we got it. I'm also trying to work on getting us on the lady tubes, which is, you know, those ladies that are inside the tubes that you have in your house. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? <laughs> huh? Where you ask them questions and they respond back to you. Although mine's, mine's a man tube. I got mine set to a man voice. <laughs> <laughs> but we'd love to hear from you. Let us know what you think about this episode and the topic that they covered. Email us, go with the heat at gmail.com. That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and we'll see you all next time. Bye, pal.